All right. Welcome back. Last week, if you're one of the people that watched the videos back on demand on our YouTube channel, you probably only have Psalms 50, uh, 33 and not 34 because last week's episode did not record correctly. So, uh, that'll be a private treat just for you that the, just for you that attend regularly. <laughs> But we did talk about Psalm 34 in our previous lesson. Does anybody uh, remember what we uh, discussed? Mm -hmm. Do we acknowledge that there were afflictions that we would face but praise Him anyway? Yep, yep. Anything else? Anybody got any remembrance about verse 8? Can I remember what we talked about there? Not necessarily. Well, and also testing your faith, testing your trust and confidence. Anything else? Well, Larry, you said you had something. Well, just seemingly the first two verses almost like he recognizes the salvation. Like, mm -hmm. for, for I sought the Lord and heard him. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, and then verse, verses 1 through 3, we kind of talked a little bit about corporate worship, too. Coming together and uh, worshiping as a church is a... Um, um, is an important thing, and kind of brought us to the end of our talk, which brings us to uh, oh, one last thing on Psalm thirty-four. Does anybody remember the historical significance of that chapter? It's written in the superscription. There you go. When he was on, when he immediately ran from. Um, Saul we talked about how he immediately ran to where he didn't go to his family he didn't go to his friends he didn't go gather a troop of heroes to to uh, uh, all all things of which he would eventually do uh, but he went to the house of the Lord and he talked to Abimelech the, uh, the high priest at the time he acquired the shoe bread he acquired the sword of David um, and then uh, he talked he went and talked um and in the same chapter, he also went to the um, um, Akish uh, and had to feign himself a madman to prevent himself from being killed. Um, but that chapter is referenced in 1 Samuel uh, from that superscription at the top of Psalm 34. We're bringing this to Psalm 35. Um, simply the superscription reading a Psalm of David. Um, from my uh, uh, research, I haven't found anything specific on what uh, part or time of life uh, David was in at this point, but it is um, it is another, and, and you start to see, especially with the Psalms of David, David wrote a lot of Psalms when David was in trouble, <laughs> when David was having problems. And this is, is not unlike other things that we have seen before, but perhaps that there are a few things within the chapter that we can we can focus in on and draw out for, uh, for study here. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive against me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take a hold of the shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. This chapter opens with like a lot of the other psalms that we've uh, that we've looked at, and I'm sure a lot of the psalms that we will see in the future, uh, with a request for aid by David, and David was looking to uh, find help against those that were uh, seeking to uh, to harm to harm him, and he mentions a couple of things. First of all, 
Um, he wanted to fight against them that fight against me. Now, there is some more detail to this that he's going to add later in the psalm uh, that is important to uh, remember and important to look at. But uh, specifically, he wanted, he wanted the Lord's help against some, to reciprocate actions that were being made against him. Um, David, in the entirety of the time that he was on the run for Saul, and I'm not saying that this psalm was definitely written in that time, but in the entirety of the time that he ran from Saul, uh, never once lifted his hand against Saul. You never find that. He had plenty of opportunity. In fact, there's a specific passage in 1 Samuel where he goes in there, I think he takes some stuff from above the head of Saul, runs out to the edge of camp and hollers back and says, Hey, I was in your camp. Here's your stuff right here. I had the opportunity to slay you, and I did not. And that kind of seems antithetical to what we're seeing in this chapter, but it's really not because David is not asking for strength for his own battle, which is we have seen some of that in the past. We have uh, he's not asking for. Um, he's not asking for a, a military uh, um, uh, force to join him to make him uh, better at uh, defending against his foes. He's not asking for spiritual blessing to rise up against the spiritual enemies in his life. No, he's asking the Lord to do battle for him. Now, this calls to our mind, um, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And that's God saying that, it is not our place, it is not our duty to lay hands. Right. It's not our, it's not our, uh, uh, our place to seek uh, repercussions for someone else's actions against us. He literally says that at the end of verse 6, fight them that fight against me. The, you may think, well, uh, Brother Adam, doesn't didn't Jesus in the New Testament throw out everybody in the temple? Very specific set of circumstances. Um, also, Jesus was God. So if if, if 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 it says vengeance is mine, I will repay. Uh, Jesus was within his full right um, to uh, because this is this is the thing about vengeance and this is the thing about meeting out punishment and something that I think we talked about two or maybe even three weeks ago is that we're incapable of the judgment required to correctly meet out the punishment that needs to be meet out um, as parents. It is, it is in the job description to mete out punishment and judgment upon your children as best as you see fit. But even as parents, we realize sometimes even in the moment, sometimes even years later, that we made mistakes in our judgment calls. And that's something very, very small. And, and not saying that raising a child is small. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great work. It's, you're, you're literally putting the building blocks of another human being together, uh, of who they're going to be. But... Um, in the grand scheme of things, in, in, in light of the universe, uh, a, a very small judgment call to make. And even in that, we're incapable of always making the correct judgment call. So how can we make a judgment call against someone who is actively trying to do us harm? I don't think we can. And so what David is asking for here is help against the people that are fighting him by the hand of God. Let him take care of the issue I don't need to be involved. And in fact, he just wants, he, he, he asked for two things. Verse 2, he asked for the shield and the buckler. And verse 3, he says, draw out the spear. He's asking for defense. Keep them off of me. So I want you to protect me. And then draw out the spear. I want you to be the aggressor. I want you to be both defense and offense for me. I'm not going to raise a hand. Uh, you do see some of this, uh, which uh, Jesus was very submissive to his death, but you see some of that even in his crucifixion, uh, like a sheep dumb to the shearers. He opened not his mouth. When it, people threw so many accusations against him, nary did he ever raise his hand uh, against them, even though it's clear, especially from if you look in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had all the power necessary to make that happen. Um and then at the end of verse 3, he wants to say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. I don't know if that's capital S salvation, 
uh, like soul saving salvation. But I think in context of what we can see here, I think this is just deliverance, just help out of a situation that 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 David was in. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord uh, persecute them. Now, he is calling for some specific things to happen. He's, he's uh, if you will, he's uh, offering counsel to the Lord on, on the ways in which the Lord might mete out that punishment. He said, let them be confounded and put to shame them that seek after my soul. He wants them to be confused. He wants them to, to, be, um, to be stymied in their actions. Um, I actually think you, you might be able to see a little bit of this in the New Testament when he says, uh, Paul, Paul, uh, Saul, Saul, why, why persecutest thou me? It's, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I'm sure there were moments where the confounding nature of Paul, Saul's persecution was 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 against him there. Um, the um, uh, let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devised my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind. Now this is a um, a metaphorical um, device that he's using here, but he wants them to be powerless. Chaff has no ability before before a breeze. Chaff doesn't have any way to. Um, to hold itself, to make sure that it doesn't go away. Even even with a strong enough wind, if you bind chaff all together in a bale, like a straw bale, it, it will still go away. Uh, it, it, the, 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 it's not Bible, but the, uh, the story of the three little pr- pigs teaches us one thing for sure, and that is things made out of straw do not, uh, do not hold up for very long. It, the Bible even kind of alludes this in a parable. Houses built on sand do not stand. And he, and he said, I want you to blow them out like that. And then in verse, uh, five, uh, verse 6, he says, Let their way be dark and slippery. He wanted them to not only not be able to, to see, but he wanted the path that they were on to be treacherous. Uh, and this is an interesting thing here too, with a dark and slippery path. If I have before me two two avenues of egress, and one of them is dark and slippery, and one of them is sure-footed and maybe even away from what I was what I was seeking, it offers a decision. That David was not necessarily offering specific harm, especially in verse six. He just wanted their way the ways to get him to be difficult for them to go through. A dark, slippery path can be avoided. But he wanted to put them in it. But in both of these verses, he says, let the angel of the Lord chase them. And then he says, let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Now, this is two references in, in the, in, within two verses in this same chapter. And... Uh, there is a uh, there is a theory that this is a reference, and I, I'll see if I can remember where the verse is at. So I hate to misquote it. Oh yes, uh, uh, 2 Kings 19 verse 35 says, And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when, and when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. This is when Hezekiah was being besieged. Now, some people think that this is who David was referencing. A very, very powerful death angel. Um... I you know there I feel like between uh, mythology and Catholic appropriation and then 
what is actually truly in the Bible, it is very confusing. When you, uh, when you take, talk about the death angel, a lot of people start thinking about the Grim Reaper and that kind of stuff, which is a metaphor about death. And then people start looking at, you know, Revelation, the pale horse, and he who rides them, and all this other stuff. Uh, but uh, there, were, there are jobs specifically for the angels. The angels, not unlike us, there are many th- ways that they are unlike us, but not unlike us, are designed for specific duties. And you can see this, uh, you know, Lucifer was was the chiefest of the archangels before he fell. Uh, Michael taking the place as commander of God's uh, of God's troops. Gabriel um, being a um, a messenger of the Lord, often utilized in that way. But the role of a death angel is definitely found within Scripture. I don't know if it is a group of angels that do it, or if there is a singular death angel that comes about. But that specific type of an angel goes out and then slays a bunch of people is not unfounded by Scripture. In David's own life, he would run into a being much like this. Remember when he tried to number the people and an angel started making a tear and he eventually had to, he he set up a specific, uh, the angel went to a specific place and he had to make a specific sacrifice and the angel stayed his hand. There is also, um, look in Exodus, uh, an angel went throughout all the land of Egypt and killed every firstborn child that did not have blood on the lentils and post of the door. Um, I don't know who this angel is, but David was calling for this specific angel to stand in their way, to chase them, to persecute them. Um, And uh, uh, I'm going to make another point about this. We're going to come back to this here in just a moment, but uh, I want to to get back... Um, it's actually in verse seven. So we, 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 let's read verse seven, then we'll come back to this idea about the about this angel. Uh, uh, for uh, for without cause, they have hid from me uh, their net in a pit, which thou uh, which thou call which which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon the, uh, upon him unawares, and let his net that he, uh, that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. Now, why was David calling for this death angel? And, and, why, and, and here's, here's a lesson for us. And, and what's the application for us as Christians? Well, they were chasing after him. They were, they were pursuing him. They were causing him to fear. And David wanted something behind them to cause fear and cause terror, and, and who better than uh, than you know? I get it. Depend, it depends on whether they want to be seen or not, I guess, uh, or if you have the eyes to see them. Uh, in Elisha's case, um, but what better way than an invisible spiritual force that chases you down and kills you without without a word or a whisper? Um, and David wanted this level, I mean, this level of carnage. And we're actually going to get to these words destruction in verse 8 here in just a second. But why? Because they were doing all these things without cause. This is specifically laying David seeking help for people that were, that were looking for David's downfall for no other reason than the, let's make it David's downfall. And when we rise up, against God's own people, usually because of the hubris of our flesh or um, our emotions or whatever, without real cause. A lot of times we, we think we have a lot of reasons for something uh, when more often than not it's just it, it, it's just an excuse for us to to, to write so th- This is the type of stuff that could become at. David did not want anything going against these people than what they were bringing on him. And and this is a deadly force. This is a terrifying force. You get to verse 8 and it says, Let destruction come upon him unawares. This word destruction, did you know that um, the, uh, the Jews in the 40s, whenever they were persecuted by the Holocaust, that the Jews did not call the Holocaust the Holocaust. We called it the Holocaust. Uh, they had a word for it. And it's the same word that's used in this chapter, specifically in verse 8, destruction. Um, 
And I don't think that David was specifically referencing that specific event, but the type of destruction. Think about the Holocaust. It was starvation. It was captivity. It was unrelenting labor. And then ultimately, a brutal burning death for so, so many people. And what David is calling for is that utter destruction. I want them to feel frightened. I want them to feel captive. I want them to feel hungry. I want them to feel alone. And if it comes right down to it, I want them to experience death. Now these are very harsh terms coming after, coming out of uh, 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 of David but we have to all we have to keep referencing verse 7 these people were coming after him for no reason David didn't provoke this David didn't ask for this why do bad things happen sometimes they just happen to show the power of God and David is as he's writing this psalm and he's and he's progressing this narrative in here is offering God ways show your power. Was it fair that Pharaoh and all of his armies uh, fell in the Red Sea? Depends on where you look at that from. For the Egyptians, probably not. The Egyptians, if you're not, if you haven't ever read Exodus, try to be sympathetic and read it from the point of the Egyptians. They had some slaves. The slaves were trying to leave. And then all of these horrible things started happening to them. Horrible. The land must have smelled horrible. They had rotting frogs. They had a river of blood. They had thousands of flies. They had dead people scattered for miles. They had livestock laying in the field, no doubt, that could just could not be collected because they didn't have enough people to collect them. Blight and famine and all these things. And the people run out. They finally let them go. And then Pharaoh says, we're going to get our revenge. And they go down there to get them. And then they die anyway. All of them. Every last person. And that seems pretty unfair. And you say, well, Adam, they were slaves. Well, but, but the Egyptians experienced a lot there. They experienced the power of God. And for what? Yeah, they made the Hebrews work. They even made them try to make bricks without, without straw. They whipped them. They, put, they persecuted them. Go all the way back to when Moses was born. They killed a lot of babies. But what had they done specifically to Moses? Nothing. What had they done specifically to Aaron? Nothing. What had they had done specifically to that generation of Israelites? Nothing except not give them straw to make bricks. And yet all this came upon them. So the, the justification that a man, and I said all that to say this. I'm not trying to bolster <laughs> uh, 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 sadness or, or remorse on the part of the Egyptian. But what I'm, what I'm going to point out is the remorse or the, or, the, or the human logic that we would try to place upon God's wrath is not on the same level as what we put it. The Egyptians deserved everything they got and then some. They are they earned the they earned the recompense of Pharaoh's hard heart over and over and over again. And David was and 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 what had been done to David to 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 cost us nothing. What why why would the Israelites go into slavery in the first place? We don't really have a really solid answer for that. Just out of the blue, there rose up a, a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. David's walking along one day, and then all of a sudden he's being pursued by people. He's being hunted by people. How scared and, and frightened he He literally had to leave home with nothing. That, that is why he went to the tabernacle, by the way. It's because he didn't, he didn't have nothing but the clothes in his best. He didn't have a weapon, didn't have food, didn't have anything. And David wanted them to feel what he was feeling right then. And that's scared and hungry and tired. And if it be, if it be by the very angel of death himself, let it be. Show your power. Um, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor 
uh, from him that is uh, too strong for him. Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up, and they did lay uh, uh, to my charge things I knew not. Sound familiar? Um, they rewarded me evil for uh, for good to uh, for, uh, for good to the spoiling of my soul. As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. My prayer returned into my bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been uh, been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in, in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together um, against me, and I knew it not. They did t- uh, tear me and ceased not. Now... David puts a f- extra layer of explanation on this. Not only did he not do anything, these same people, people like Saul, who he had helped, who he had, who, who he had nurtured, he married one of Saul's daughters. People that he had been with and, and struggled with, and out, this could be even a reference to when he was on the run from Absalom. The child that I raised, I was there, I, I, you know, when, when they needed comfort, I put on the comfort hat. That's pretty much what he says. When, 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 when they needed a shoulder to cry on, I was there. When something was going on for them, I mourned for them like it was my own mother that had passed. But the minute that it turned, where are all these people? Uh, th- these are the type of friends, first of all, that the world will offer you. Your good time buddies are not called good time buddies for no reason. It's because they're only there in the good times. (laughs) And they're willing to toss you under the bus because you're not like them. I think I've told this story on multiple occasions. We had a a cow, Bessie, who who thought she was a horse. She liked to go over to the horse farm and hang out with the horses. It's mostly because she was alone. Herd animals need other other herd animals. And we just had the one cow. Um, And... Uh, but it was her. It was her nature to want to be with other animals of her. So she would go over there with the horses. Now I don't know if you know anything about uh, you know uh, horses and cows are both mammals, and that's kind of where the similarities stop on on those two creatures. Um, uh, they're both herbivores. I guess they got that in common. But horses are are, are equine. They're from a whole different family of of of, of mammals. And, and and cows are bovine. They are they are they are from their own like branch of animals. And and there's and they have two different kind of families. There's you know uh, 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 is um oh I forget uh, is it um there's like a there's there's some very odd animals that you wouldn't think that are related to horses that are related to horses. But you know you got you got uh, why can buffalo and cows breed together and you make beefaloes? Well, it's because they're all in the same family together. But Bessie the cow was not with her kind. She was running to them for comfort. She was running to them for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, a time to to uh, 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 to hang out, to have a good time, to graze upon the pastures that uh, Mr. Scotty Richardson had there on his on his on his horse farm. But at the end of the day, if it came down to it, and the horses had to run and leave the cow behind, they would leave the cow behind because that cow wasn't like them. Deer take care of their own. And just in the same way, your good time buddies and people that are, and, and this is a hard thing to say, that are, are, are damned and destined to go to hell, they're not like you. And they will leave you just as sure as this world. And does that mean that we can't be friendly to them? No. I, Bessie the cow and the horses got along just fine as far as we could tell. Scotty didn't even, he, I think he called a couple of times and he eventually got where he just didn't, it didn't even bother him anymore. We just looked for the cow and we knew where to look for it. Uh, it was it was down there in that pasture, and you can be friendly with these people. And in fact, I think the word of God implies that we should be. We should be peaceable to them. That we should be. That we should. That we should show forth the kindness and grace of our Father. But make no mistake, they are not your friends. They are not your people. And like verse fifteen says, when your adversity comes, they will gather together. They will conspire together against you. Make a you know uh, uh, start talking to a a very worldly and even mildly liberal uh, friend, and 
present your stance on homosexuality and, and see how long that conversation remains friendly between the two of you. It won't be long. Because that's that you're talking about their kind. <laughs> with hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from li- from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise uh, thee among the people. Let them not, let them that are mine. Enemies wrong. Uh, let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink uh, with the eye uh, that hate me without cause. For they speak not peace, but they divide deceit, devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they open their mouth wide against me and said, Aha! Our eyes have seen it. This hast thou seen, O Lord. Keep not thy silence. O Lord, be not far from thee. Stir thy, uh, up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my calls, my God and my Lord. Now this brings us back to where I was talking about at the top of the lesson. We're incapable of meeting out judgment. So whose judgment does he call upon? Judge me, O Lord my God, according to thy righteousness. Everything that I have, basically everything that he says, everything that I've said previously in this chapter, come down, uh, you know, rise up from your throne and look down and see if I am not the, if I am not speaking the truth right now. Use your righteousness and measure the situation. Let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so we have it. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at my heart. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them uh, say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure and pros- uh, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Now we see a, tr- a change here in verse 27. He said, verse 26 tells us where he wants the end place for these people to be, confused and ashamed for what they've done. And in verse 27 it says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Now, this goes into the rejoicing. And I, I like that David a lot of time, either either at the beginning or end of his song, sometimes both, offers praise to God. And what he's saying here is that he wants other people to rejoice with him. Now, in a situation where the Lord has delivered you, it is up to you often. Sometimes sometimes the Lord's deliverance is very public, and people can see it and can rejoice with you in that manner. But it is, it is an opportunity for you to say, let me tell you what the Lord has done for me today, and have that person rejoice with you. We just talked about kinds. Let your own kind be happy and rejoice with you and, and pray with you and, and, uh, and be uplifting with you. Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. David's promise upon the Lord's deliverance is utter praise for his swift retrieval and his, and his swift action. It is not, again, it is not against the Bible. It's not against the, for us to call upon the Lord to take action. Now, just because we say jump does not mean he will say how high. It is for him to judge whether he will jump or not. And I think that's, he kind of gets to that in, 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 in the ending verses of the chapter. But make no mistake, he will come to our aid. We are his children. He has said that we are his brothers. He has said that we are joint heirs with him, that we are deserved of the same kingly blessings that he, that, that, that he is worthy of. And why should we not be worthy of aid? Trust and confidence in him. And then follow through on the end of the chapter. Rejoice and praise him for what he's done when he, de- when he decides to do it. Any questions or comments on Psalm 35? If not, we will be dismissed. Y'all have a great week. Thank you.